Hey everyone, my name is Eric and today we're going to be talking about five categories you should consider training on to be effective with your carbine as a modern day Minuteman. Roll the intro. Hey everyone, it's Eric from Barrel and Hatchet, and thank you for checking out another Hatchet Cast episode. And today we're going to be talking about five categories you should consider training on to be effective with your carbine as a modern day Minuteman. Before we get started, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button. It really does help out the channel. Also, if you'd like to check out the comment section for some knowledge, there's always tons of knowledge that's shared inside that comment section. There's the occasional troll here and there, but majority of the comments there are positive and are actually people who are trying to help pass on knowledge or help anybody that has questions. So if you're new to the Barrel and Hatchet community and this channel, go check out the comments section and really uh, dive in deep there. There's a lot of people who contribute, so make sure you also contribute as well if you have knowledge to share. Now the five different categories that we're gonna cover today is gonna be the fundamentals of marksmanship, rifle carries, sling manipulation, reloads, and positional shooting and barricades. So the first thing we're gonna jump into is the fundamentals. Now the fundamentals are the foundation of your journey. As you as a shooter, you are going to have to learn and understand the fundamentals. Now I come from a military background and I learned the fundamentals through the military and the military taught a lot of great things and a lot of bad things. They taught a lot of inefficient ways to execute the fundamentals. And these things are doctrine. If you want to have repeatability when it comes to marksmanship and you want to have consistency in your ability, you need to have a strong foundation in the fundamentals. So if you're going to take a class, you need to find a class that is going to help you become effective when it comes to building a strong foundation in the basics. A lot of competition shooters and guys who are really, really good um, out there, you know, the Jerry Mitchlicks of the world, they have taken every inefficiency out of their fundamentals and their basics. I like to use this analogy in my classes. When I tell students, I said, have you ever heard of an NFL player or a professional football player who has gone to advanced catching school? No, you haven't. They just are really good at the basic skill of catching a ball. And so it's the same when it comes to shooting. There are these basic fundamental foundational things that you have to master and as you grow as a shooter you become more efficient at doing those quickly and under stress so when it comes to the foundation you got to make sure that your foundation is strong so whenever you go to a course make sure that they are teaching sound fundamentals and teaching things that are going to make you a better shooter and not teach you a bunch of bad habits that you have to break for example when it comes to my stance i was really you know, ingrained with the idea that you have to lean into your recoil and that you have to be aggressive and lean forward into the gun to be able to counter that. Well, I found out through, you know, going to other instructors and other shooters and, and competition shooters and kind of seeing what they have to say about it. And they're like, no nah, man, like, you know, with this caliber, you can just have a very straight up and down back, a good center of gravity and a wide base. And as long as you keep your back nice and straight and bring that gun to your face, you can control the recoil very well through good technique. And so I started doing that. And that was just one example of how to be more efficient at the fundamentals so that way you can be faster and more accurate. At the end of the day, make sure you take a class and learn from somebody who is really good at those basics because it's always something that you can rely on and having a strong foundation is important when you start stacking other skill sets on top of that, especially if you want to be an actual good shooter. So after you have that foundation set and you figure out the basics and you start taking out those inefficiencies, the next thing that you wanna think about is your rifle carries or just how I carry the gun. So let's jump into that. When it 
it comes to carrying the rifle, it's dependent upon two things, control of the muzzle and threat level, all right? So you've got different types of ways that you carry the rifle to fulfill those two things. Now, I'm gonna give a quick disclaimer when it comes to the rifle carries. There are different names for certain carries that depending on what background you have or where you were stationed or what military branch you were in or what agency you were part of, they may have called the same type of carry I'm talking about differently. And so there might be some flip-flop of the names, but at the end of the day, the principle is still the same. So whatever you wanna call it, call it that. Whatever you learn in class, just, just run with that, especially if that's something that um, you know, you're new to these type of carries. The big thing is just understanding what the carry is, the point of it, and also the concept. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is the one that we're all comfortable with and that we know very well, which is the low ready. Now the low ready is a, is a level of readiness, depending on my threat level, I might go to a low ready because I'm about to engage a target, I need to still keep a clear view in an unobstructive um, peripheral vision, so I'm gonna have that rifle at a low ready. My stock is gonna be welded in my shoulder, and obviously I have my safety on and my finger off the trigger. Well, a good low ready, you wanna have that muzzle in line with your belt buckle or pointed at the base of the target. But it's a, it's a level of readiness to carry that rifle in that way. So the low ready. Now, the other carry that's confused often with a low ready, that's almost like a gaming version of the low ready, is the modified ready. Now, the modified ready is the same exact thing where I have my stock and my shoulder. I have my, you know, safety on, my fingers off the trigger, but I'm looking over top of the optic now. So I have that rifle pointed at my target or where my intended target's going to be, and I have my optic right underneath my field of view. So if a threat pops out or I'm getting ready to engage a target in a competition, I just flip safety off, bring my head down into that window, and I squeeze off the shot. So it's a very fast um, rifle carry that you can get into, especially if I'm getting ready to engage a target. Uh, and it's, it's still a good way to be able to have a, a good level sense of control on the gun while also being ready to engage the target when that time comes. The next carry is the high ready. Now the high ready is where I have two hands on the rifle. I'm actually maneuvering in a tighter space or I'm maneuvering around people and I don't want to flag anybody and I have the rifle pointed in an upward position. Now for me, I like to look through my muzzle device at my target or where I'm going so that way I have that muzzle device in my peripheral vision and I always am controlling that muzzle. This one is a a very good and useful and productive carry, a very good way to maneuver in tight spaces, but it's also one that if you are not disciplined in it, it can be a dangerous carry because if you're relaxed and lazy with that carry, you could be end up muzzling somebody's head. So if you're going to utilize that carry, you gotta be very deliberate with it and have it very controlled. A lot of people call this the Navy SEAL carry. Uh, so there's some departments that use it at the end of the day you utilize the carry that makes sense for the situation that you're in. As long as I have two things, I have good control of the muzzle and it's, and it's dependent on my threat level. So if I'm in a high ready, that's a good one to be able to utilize maneuvering around people and obstacles without flagging. The opposite of the high ready is the compressed ready and that's where they have the rifle straight down. I have the stock dislocated from my shoulder, just like the high ready but I have it where I can have that muzzle pointed straight down in between my feet and super, super strong control of the muzzle. I can maneuver that around, I can go in tight spaces, I can maneuver it around people, and I can snap the rifle back up whenever I need to engage a target quickly. This is a really good carry to be able to control the muzzle in a tight space as well. It's the opposite of high ready. Now, this next carry frees up a support hand, it's called the high port. And this is where I have a rifle in one hand and my support hand in the other, and the rifle is pointed up. Now, depending on the department or the agency, some people flip-flop high ready and high port and what they call it, but the principle is the same. So, this is a good carry to be able to free up that support hand. It's a good carry to run when I'm running around and also not flagging anybody. I'm able to keep strong control of the muzzle and I'm also able to bend over and pick things up or do other tasks without having to have two hands on the gun. Another 
carry that is actually my favorite carry that allows me to have a free support hand or freeze up my support hand is the football carry or the Daniel Boone carry. Now this one is really, really nice because I can really, really be aggressive in controlling the muzzle. I have a lot of manipulation. It's super good for running. So if I'm maneuvering or running from one place to another, it's a very good carry to have strong control of the muzzle and still be able to swing my arm for momentum. And also, I can carry this rifle very comfortably in this position. Um, it's good for like patrols, uh, it's good for like standing around or whatever, but it gives you a sense of dominance, you know, power perceived is power achieved, a, a sense that you are, you know, a squared away Minuteman, but also is a secure way to carry the rifle and have complete control of it. I can use this carry whenever I'm swinging the rifle from my front to my back, which we'll talk about later in a sling manipulation portion. And also I can bend down, I can control the muzzle that way. It's just a very comfortable way to carry the gun. And it's one of my favorite ways to carry. Whenever you run with two hands on the rifle, most time you see guys wanting to swing their arms, but their hands are glued to the rifle, so it ends up swinging the rifle and flagging people. So this is why I like this carry, because it just makes it a little bit more responsible with my muzzle control, and it allows me more momentum for my arms to be able to run from point A to point B. Now I've figured out how to carry the rifle, and I've learned about different rifle carries and good ways to be smart with my muzzle control but I need to manipulate the gun a lot more, so I need to understand sling manipulation. Now, when it comes to sling manipulation, I like to use a two-point sling, and the two-point sling that I like to use is the Lunar Concepts Contour Sling. I also like the Baseline Sling, which is the non-padded version from Lunar Concepts, and those are actually available at Wiseman Company. Now, I've used all kinds of slings, uh, I've used Blue Force Gear slings, Magpul slings, the big fat one, Vicker slings, um, you know, you name it, I've used it. I have used to run single point slings back when they were the Rage, the bungee ones, and so I've run all types. And I've always gravitated back to the two point sling, and I gravitate towards two point slings, usually they're not padded, but the contour sling is the exception. And the reason it's the exception is because it contours around the shoulder blade and it actually have a left-handed version and a right-handed version. Um, the padding is super tight, it's very minimalist, it's very, very sturdy, I like that. It also slides around on my shoulder when I'm maneuvering my rifle around my gear, it doesn't get caught or hung up on my plate carrier or anything that I have on my body. So it's just really nice in that way. And for me, I like to have also a very good slider that doesn't have a ton of friction on it. Like uh, for example, the Magpul slider has a ton of friction on that. And so I don't have the ability to be able to tighten the sling and loosen it extremely fast when I need to and snap it into those positions. So for me, the slider is a big, a big thing for a sling. And I like to have the sling on as far away from each other at the ends as possible. So I like to have it where it hugs to my body. For me, a sling should be able to hold the rifle to my body with no hands, and I should also have control of the muzzle when I stow that rifle away. So if I can stow that rifle nice and tight whenever I need both hands to do a task, and that sling does that for me, then that's a big win for me. The other thing is also whenever I'm getting ready to fight, I will sli slightly loosen that sling a little bit and swim in and out of my sling, and that allows me to maneuver the rifle a lot more. And we actually talk about this in our fighting carving course. Um, there's other courses and instructors that do this as well, but being able to manipulate your sling so it works for you and not against you is a huge bonus. At the end of the day, we gotta remember the sling is a tool to retain the rifle to my body with no hands, and it needs to work for me and not against me. So make sure you guys practice sling manipulation. It's a very practical thing that you need. And also, depending on what rifle carry I'm using, I need to be good with manipulating the rifle with a sling. So after I, you know, once I'm proficient with that sling manipulation, the other thing I need to consider is my loads and what type of load should I practice? So jumping into reloads, and I know this is the sexy thing that's on Instagram and social media, but there are two types of loads. You have the speed or emergency reload, or you have your tactical reload. Now the speed and emergency reload, I like to call it an emergency because I, in my opinion, I think it's an emergency procedure for real world stuff. Uh, it's a speed load if you're doing competition, just drop the mag, put a new one in, 
uh, you know, whether the mag is full or not, just if you want to top off, that's a fast way to do it. Um, but it's this super sexy reload to do for Instagram and all the social media outlets. Now, when it comes to speed reloads, obviously that's I'm out of gas, uh, I'm out of bullets, my bolt is locked back to the rear, and I have to top the gun off immediately to get it back up online. And so for me, I will usually reload from my belt from one single pouch that's called the Ready Mag Pouch. And I usually will refill that mag pouch from my vest to make sure that it's always topped off with a full mag. Now, if I'm in the middle of engaging a target and I run out of bullets mid-engagement, I need to get that gun back up fast as possible because I wasn't finished and I still have to keep shooting. So for me, I like to think of it as an emergency procedure. Now understand, I'm not putting all of my time and effort towards that, but I am gonna be proficient enough to be able to execute that reload fast. So there are a lot of good instructors that will teach you guys good ways to be able to do speed reloads in a fast way or in a non-fatiguing way and bring things to your workspace. We heavily cover this in our fighting carbon course, along with the tactical reload. Now the tactical reload is the one reload that I like to do a lot, which is topping the gun off constantly whenever I have a moment. And I can actually get pretty quick with this. You can actually do the tack reload if you practice it pretty fast. So essentially, I don't like not knowing my status on my weapon. So I always have SA on the weapon status and how about how much ammo I've gone through and when it's time to tactically reload the gun so that way I go in with a full tank. I also will tactically reload my equipment. I will, you know, my ready mag pouch, it's on my belt. If it has a half mag, I'll take that half mag out and stick it on my vest and put a full mag and shuffle that over into my ready mag. So that way I'm tactically reloading my rifle and I'm tactically reloading my, my gear as well. So either, either reload that you choose to practice, they're both important. In my opinion, I think that you should put a good amount of time into these loads. The tactical reload is gonna take a little bit more time to get used to, and there's some good ways and methods to be able to do it quickly, which we talk about in our course, and there's tons of other instructors that also cover it. But either way, you gotta be proficient at reloading the gun. Now, if you're good at reloading, most of the time you wanna to go to a kneeling position to hide behind a barricade or hide and get cover while you're trying to get the gun back up online, or you're trying to top it off. So let's talk about positional shooting next. Now, when it comes to positional shooting, this works closely with barricade shooting, um, but there are three different positions. You have your standing unsupported or standing supported on a barricade. You have your kneeling positions, which there's a whole buttload of kneeling positions, which we could talk about that as its own category almost, and then you have your prone position. Now, all of these are important, and the standing position you actually hit on in your foundation, foundational skills, your fundamentals, and uh, you know, you wanna have a wide base, a good center of gravity, but having a good standing position is important. You always wanna fight standing if you can because you can get in and out of position as quick as possible. Now, when I go to my kneeling position, there are tons of different kneeling positions that we talk about in our courses. Um, there's tons of kneeling positions that you can do that are, you know, either fast to get into, but almost like an unsupported position, or you can have a supported kneeling position, which gives you more points of contact. And that's that's the big thing you gotta remember and keep in mind is having as many points of contact as I can in my kneeling position, and also being comfortable, as well as lowering my profile and my target, right? So I don't wanna be a big target, I wanna get behind cover, so a good kneeling position is important. Kneeling positions are also gonna be dictated based off of my flexibility. So if I'm not very flexible, I might be limited as to what kneeling positions I can get into. The key to th thing to think about is make sure you don't have bone on bone, but you have muscle or flesh on bone. That way you're not rolling around and being unstable in that position. Either way, practice different kneeling positions that work for you. And also, if you go to a class, you will probably be exposed to kneeling positions, but either way, it's a good thing to practice. Now, when it comes to your prone position, it's the most stable position out of all the positions you can get in. It's also the lowest profile that you can get. It's also something that, unless you have a clear line of sight, you may not be able to always be in the prone position. But I like to also get as many points of contact as I can. Yeah, I will even put the magazine on the ground and utilize that as a point of contact to stabilize the rifle as much as I, poss as I possibly can. Now, if I was gonna shoot far shots or distant shots, if I have a bipod, that's additional points of contact. 
um, to make me more stable. I'm gonna take my feet and lay them as flat as I possibly can on the ground for more stability. So that way I minimize movement in that gun and I can get more repeatable, faster engagements whenever I'm in that prone position. The biggest thing to think about in the prone is making sure I have good muzzle control, and this is honestly actually for any type of position I get into, making, making sure my safety's on, making sure my finger's off the trigger, and also making sure I have strong muzzle control. This is where I've seen guys kind of forget about muzzle awareness, or they are, don't, they're not engaging their safety as they're moving into different positions, and they're increasing the risk of an ND. So you don't wanna be that person that ends up NDing because you're changing positions and you didn't put your safety on. Always put your safety on whenever you're moving, moving positions. It's always a good practice. It's, it's, honestly, it's the only practice you should be practicing, and also keeping that finger straight and off the trigger. So whenever I am going into different positions, it's usually in conjunction with shooting in and around a barricade. Now with barricades, I want to increase as many points of contact as I can and get as much of the surface area of my gun on that barricade to stabilize it for repeatable shots. And I wanna get into the correct position that suits me for getting nice and tight behind that rifle while I'm behind the barricade. So I don't wanna be off, off center. I don't wanna be off balance. I wanna be as stable as I possibly can behind that gun and also when I'm looking for a barricade, I'm looking for something that's going to make it super conducive to making fast and repeatable engagements, right? Um, when it comes to barricades also for real world stuff, you wanna make sure that it has, uh, you know, the ability to give you cover and concealment, right? So I'm looking for a stable barricade, something that gives me cover and concealment and offers me the ability to, to, to be more effective. When it comes to your barricade also, you may be only afforded a small porthole or a, a small area that you can actually aim the rifle through. So if I have limitations of my barricade, so I get a ton of cover or I'm being engaged a lot, so I wanna be as small of a target as possible and engage out of a small port, I may have to roll the rifle over. Um, I'm gonna definitely have to consider my height over bore, so I'm not blasting my barricade and not even realizing it. That's something you should definitely consider. Who's been to a, v a range and you see a VTAC barricade and it has a ton of bullet holes in it? That's because people aren't considering their height over bore. So you need to make sure that you're considering your height over bore when you're shooting around a barricade and also being able to engage targets when you have that rifle rolled over on the side. All right, so just get that lower profile. Understand if I'm doing that and I'm going into a rifle rolled over type scenario, it better be giving me something. Like I better have a good reason for doing it. And most of the time that's to lower my, my target size. So I don't have to be as big of a target. I can get lower behind that barricade and kind of hugging behind that cover a little bit more. So that's the advantage I get. Um, but make sure whenever you're doing stuff like that, you are weighing your pros and cons and doing what makes you most effective as a rifleman. So at the end of the day, guys, you know, there are tons of things that you should be practicing. The big one though is making sure you have that strong foundation so that way I can stack on different ways to be able to carry the rifle safely, have strong control of the muzzle, be aware of my surroundings, making me effective to move around structure or teammates, also being able to manipulate the rifle with my sling if I go empty, I gotta figure out how to reload and what's the proper load to be able to stay topped off and having situational awareness of my carbine. The other thing also is, you know, getting in behind cover and finding the best position that makes me the most stable to get those repeatable fast engagements. So these are things that you work on and is the practical way to shoot. Um, you know, depending on whether you're a modern minute man and you're training to be a prepared citizen, or if you're shooting competition, you know, there's tons of avenues you can go through in terms of how the style, what style you wanna have as a shooter. But the biggest thing is having a strong foundation and going out and developing your own style, going out and getting training and absorbing the information and the styles that other shooters and instructors have, and then you developing your own regimen. At the end of the day, guys, make sure you go out and train. 
If you guys, if you haven't already and you did enjoy that episode, make sure you follow and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Also check out our other YouTube channel called the Hatchet Cast Podcast. We do have a Spotify channel as well, which is what the Hatchet Cast Podcast episodes are also on. So you can go on Spotify or the Hatchet Cast Podcast. Um, we post on there every week. Also go check out our Instagram page for behind the scenes type stuff and information about what's in stock on the website, which is also a great way to support us. If you want to come train with us, we love training with you guys. It's so humbling to train with you guys and be able to meet y'all um, and really awesome to connect with you guys. So make sure you come train with us. If you'd like to support us even more and you, and you wanna support the community, make sure you become a lifetime member. It, the lifetime membership costs the same as two courses um, so your first year as a lifetime member, you get access to two free courses the first year, and then you get a free course every year for life. Um, so it is a good way to um, make sure that you incentivize training, but also it's a great way to support the channel. Also guys, make sure you pick up some merch or any type of gear. We do have some new shirts and hats and stuff coming in, as well as we do have chest rigs also coming back in stock. So make sure you check that out. Gentlemen and ladies, if you want to save some money, go check out the description below for any discounts for from the affiliates that we have and everything else is just to save you guys money. So make sure you guys save some money. Use those codes up. Um, yeah, let's make 2024 the year of training, you guys. So go out, train some family members, help some friends who are getting into this. If you know anybody in, that is getting into carbine or just got a new AR or an AK or something like that, train them up, it's a great way to instill your skill set and also helps to train other people to be responsible and prepared citizens. End of the day, guys, make sure you train to be the asset, not the liability, and I'll see you on the next one.